every element that goes into how psychedelics can be beneficial. And so uh, I'm going to focus mostly on the cognitive slash behavioral side as to why these substances are so helpful, as opposed to looking at the exact biomechanical processes that occur within the brain that make these changes possible. This is because I am not yet qualified to talk about neurochemistry, and I do not want to accidentally share misinformation. Um, so here is a list of a few psychedelics and other psychoactives of which the government considers illicit drugs that are showing potential for treatment of mental illness. Notice that most of them can treat both depression and addiction. So why is this? Um, we must start with two considerations. One, what causes drug dependence and drug abuse? So why do people choose to do certain harmful drugs or use them in harmful ways? And two, how psychedelics can help you shift your perception of both the self and the things you do to yourself and how that shift can cause major beneficial changes in cognition and behavior, which is essentially the basis of modern therapy. Uh, so the psychedelic experience can help a person to open their eyes to the reality of their situation, as sometimes it is impossible to see your life from the outside in, especially if a person is not used to the practice of inner reflection. However, through this inner reflection, the motivation to stop using um, in a way the person is using can then become intrinsic. That is come from within, which is the most powerful kind of motivation. This includes motivation to become a better person, not just to stop or curb unhealthy drug habits. Remember that it is important to be in a good setting and have a positive or at least self-assured mindset, as well as to set an intention of doing some good work with yourself as you go into the experience. With this in mind, we can start to participate in the positive upward cycle that is healing. The more we become in tune with ourselves, the more we can start to understand and appreciate the world around us. Um. But this starts with the self. A lot of the time, drug abuse comes from some deeply unsettled and disconnected relationship with the self. Anxiety, pain, depression, a lifetime of chronic stress, and living in a culture that doesn't necessarily say or understand you, these are all things that can make a person hateful of themselves in life. From this hate, we seek to numb ourselves, um, and in order to numb, we turn to palliatives such as alcohol, nicotine, and perhaps even stronger things like opiates or benzo benzodiazepines. Uh, this is not to say that these substances are inherently evil. They definitely have a place in society, but the potential for abuse is there. When you combine that potential for abuse with the stigma surrounding seeking help and being viewed by others as an addict, you get people who are no longer living a conscious and loving life, but instead one steeped in shame, fear, hurt, and hatred towards the self. Psychedelics can help undo these deep-seated conceptions of the, uh, of the self and the world, by breaking down the walls of rigid perception that we are subjected to, merely by existing in a world in which survival is the key priority. So where does addiction come from and why do I keep bringing it up in a presentation about mental health? Uh, as for the first part of that question, it is not nearly as simple or straightforward as step one, take a drug habitually for a certain amount of time. Step two, be addicted. Although, unfortunately, many people in our society believe that that is the way that it works, thanks to the stigma created by the government for political reasons and, unfortunately, not actually to keep people safe and healthy. Even researchers believe that this was the way that it worked, um, and it was due in part to the way they were running their research. Uh, so it looks like this. They would stick a rat, of whom are naturally smart, playful, and extremely social creatures, alone into a bear cage with nothing more than two bottles of water, one with normal water and one laced with morphine. What do you think happened? Naturally, the rat became obsessive with the morphine laced bottle and drank it until they died of overdose. Remember though that rats are playful and social creatures, just like humans, that need a certain amount of stimulation in order to be happy. Think about if you were stuck in a plain right room with no one to talk to for your entire existence. No games, no internet, no books, no tools, no stimulation whatsoever. Only some water, some food, and drugs. It is clear as day to me that anyone put into that situation would choose to do the drugs, if not only to not lose their mind. Um, so actually, the situation that I'm talking about, minus the drugs, is actually a form of torture that has been done in the past, to induce severe depression and psychosis in the individual being tortured. Being left in that room over a certain amount of time, roughly over a week, 
will actually cause severe and permanent brain damage. Um, so to test the idea of setting, uh, in the 1970s, researcher Bruce Alexander built what he affectionately called Rat Park, which was essentially a rat utopia. The rats had a social life, toys to play with, tubes to run down, things to chew on, anything a rat could ever want in their lives. Once again, the researcher included the two water bottles, one normal and one laced, and this is where it gets fascinating. In Rat Park, hardly any of the rats even touched the laced water, and none of them died from an overdose, as opposed to 100% of the rats dying from overdose in previous studies. Um, so applying this directly to people, at around the same time in history, in the 1970s, we can look at the effects of the Vietnam War on the individuals who were forced to participate in it. About 20% of those soldiers overseas were using heroin, and the American populace was terrified that they were going to come back as heroin zombies when the war was over. It was found, however, that on their return back to homes in America, 95% of the soldiers using overseas completely stopped using heroin altogether. There was no need to send them to rehab, and they did not experience withdrawal symptoms. So thinking about the old model of addiction, wherein if you take a drug habitually, you are surely going to be addicted to it no matter what due to the chemical hooks that are present, this result makes no sense. These shoulder, sh shoulders, soldiers should have had crippling addiction to heroin regardless of where in the world they were. But of course, we are now starting to understand that quality of life is extremely important in understanding not only mental health, but addiction as well. And a lot of the time, we do not get to choose the quality of life that we are living. We are born into the situations we are born into. And that isn't to say that you can't get out of that situation, but factors such as socioeconomic stress, as well as prejudice or being a part of a disenfranchised population, and the resulting de de uh, depression of said stress makes doing so incredibly difficult for a majority of people, which is why by beginning to look inwards can be so incredibly powerful. In this action, a person can start to take control of their mental state back into their own hands. This is why addiction and mental health are inextricably linked. So this blends into the idea that depression and addiction are diseases of civilization. This theory posits that diseases such as depression and ultimately addiction are caused by the low-grade oxidative stress that we are all exposed to by living in the modern world as opposed to tribal communities or a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And through this stress, we become prone to these afflictions through a series of complex processes in the brain and body. It has been found that ayahuasca specifically, um, although if we tested other substances, we might find them similarly useful, helps guard the brain and body against these processes, as well as having the potential to reverse them. Uh, so as a reminder, um, it is still possible to be psychologically dependent on any of these substances, LSD, psilocybin, ketamine, etc which is why it is important to be clear and honest with yourself about your use. It would be silly to use a substance to help yourself become free from the grasp a different substance has on you, only to find yourself in the similar situation with the thing that was supposed to help. This is part of the reason I am attempting to use my future PhD to facilitate psychedelic experiences with clients, to help focus their minds on the task at hand, as well as to help them deal with and understand emotional upheavals that could turn into a bad trip quite easily for the inexperienced. However, that is not to say that this process cannot be done by the individuals themselves. Um, so yeah, thanks everybody. This concludes my short little presentation. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, this topic is incredibly, thank you, uh, incredibly complex and there are many nuances that I did not cover or maybe haven't even considered myself. And so I'm excited to hear what you all have to say about this. Once again, I will be sending out a Word document with my transcript, as well as a smattering of links to articles and studies that show, in a scientific manner, how helpful psychedelics can be. So yeah, that's it.